Alrighty, so we are now officially recording. Um, okay, excellent. So, for the panel here, uh, I have seven questions, kind of eight-ish. We may or may not have time to, to get to all of the questions, but before I get into them, what I'll ask our panelists to do is just to kind of go down uh, the row here, maybe take a couple of minutes to explain who you are, what your business does, and you know things around number of employees and or focus and or clientele and kind of services and or products that you provide and that will help give us a context of what your reference is when you're when you're answering questions so brad if you're sitting there on the end why don't you why don't you start us off please? sure uh brad williams i run an agency called web dev studios uh we specialize in wordpress from small sites all the way up to enterprise level uh, projects. Uh, it's a pretty wide range. We also have a maintenance department called Maintain, uh, where we service hundreds of kind of small business water type sites, helping them with updates, making sure things are working correctly, backup, security scanning, all that stuff. So pretty, pretty much encompass you know all sides of the WordPress spectrum in terms of how people are using WordPress. Hi, I'm Jessica Riley. I have a small business and it's pixeled as just me, and I'm a developer in. I work with um, graphic designers um, and other marketing companies to do workshop development. So most of my businesses are small, and a lot of my clients actually do, even though I will put together the WordPress website, they do a lot of their own editing and content updating. So Gutenberg is definitely something we do for a lot of my clients. My name is Tracy Levesque. I co-own a web design and development agency called the Xsync in the lovely Fishtown neighborhood of Philadelphia. Um, we do agency work, we build websites for I say medium to large businesses and nonprofit organizations, and we also build and sell plugins as well. My name is Jason Coleman, and um, my company's name is Stranger Studios, but we focus on one product called Paid Memberships Pro. Uh, it's a membership plugin for WordPress, so if you want to charge for access to content and write rules about how you lock down that content, that's the plugin you would use. It runs on about 60,000 sites, and we sell uh, support and add-ons uh, services around that plugin. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So the first question that I have then is, I guess I'll start with Jessica. We'll just go down the, the row as we get started. Is what have you, or for others, your company done to explore, test, or technically prepare for Gutenberg? How much time and effort have you put in so far? Start yeah, start with okay, you, Jess. Yeah. Um, so I've played with Gutenberg personally uh, on a development site, but none of my clients have used it. Um, I think only one of my clients actually knows about Gutenberg. Um, a lot of my clients, so I have, I have a kind of a split crew of my clients, many clients that don't want to do anything with their website, and they send their content updates to me, and I'll do updates and layouts for them. And then I have some uh, clients who are very hands-on and would rather they instead of sending that work to me they'll do it and the majority of my clients use Visual Composer for their web layouts. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Visual Composer but it's pretty um, that's what it is visual it's drag and drop editor you can set column layouts for a builder um, so that's their experience. Um, so none of my clients have used it yet I personally have just played with it and that's my experience is Thing, that's really Excellent. Okay. Um, to prepare for Gutenberg, we number one, I have given my developers whatever they need if it's to learn Gutenberg development. Did get the Zach coding class? <laughs> yes. We we bought his class, and so um, I have had my developers learning it. We keep up to date on every uh, the Gutenberg blog, that team, and the GitHub repo, see what's going on. And we've made our own roadmap as to how this affects us and our products. And we are going to make branches of those things and then start building on the Gutenberg. So as far as our plugins go, we our most popular plugin is a MailChimp plugin. That's absolutely going to be affected because we need to there Blocks are going to replace shortcodes, and people insert our forms via shortcodes, so we need to make it into a block. So we will make a branch of that repo and start onboarding it. 
Um, and then for, for, for us and our, our work we do, we use, we forked um, uh, and the, what, what custom meta, meta uh, boxes. We forked that like in 2013 and we made our own branch of it. That is, that framework is absolutely going to be effective. So we need to make a branch of that. And my goal, my, what, my goal is to be able to work Gutenberg into that framework. So when we spin up custom post types, taxonomies, and meta boxes, we would be able to put into those things into blocks easily. Um, so that's how we're preparing for it. Cool. So, um, so we, our team, we're about uh, six full time. Um, everyone's a developer of some sort, either on the design side or on the backend side. Um, and we've been paying attention to the GitHub repo, following the commits is pretty good. Um, you get to see like the code that's actually committed, rather than the code that's like in question. Like if you look at pull requests, that's like stuff that's proposed. Um, so even like like different parts of the repository, and then the issues is where like the discussion is is going on. So like the commits is like this is definitely like merging in, and like more the issues and uh, the pull requests are like more forward thinking. Um, so yeah, we're definitely the same way with our plugins. Like we had sessions about. Um, really all of our add-ons. Some of our add-ons are more effective and the core plugin itself is impacted. We have short codes for things and it's a, it's a pretty easy rule of thumb that like, anything that's a short code can become a block and should become a block. Um, another thing that we've done to stay on top of Gutenberg is that at WordCamp US I sat with the, the Gutenberg project team and uh, I worked on a project for them and, and kind of one thing, I'm trying not to get ahead of questions, but one kind of change, change of reference for us I'm thinking about also is uh, that all the code is on the JavaScript side. So like uh, Joe said about how you have to learn JavaScript to work in Gutenberg, and like when you define the block, you define it in JavaScript, um, which is odd because a lot of our code is in PHP. So kind of generally, PHP code is what we call back end, and JavaScript is front end. And like all the PHP is done executing when the JavaScript loads, generally. It kind of like talks back and forth. So like our membership plugin has a lot of logic in PHP to say like, hey, this is a members only piece of the code. This, you know, should work fine. And we, we hook into WordPress at the PHP level. Mm -hmm. And then by the time the page loads, like we assume our job is done. But in the Gutenberg world, it hasn't even begun. Like they haven't defined blocks. So I was trying to work with the uh, Gutenberg team. Like how does my PHP code know what blocks are being used in the post? Um, and the answer is like, it, it, it can't, right? Because it's, it's all happening in JavaScript. So I'm like, oh, like, so there's there's kind of, some of that stuff is uh, maybe gonna get um, worked out by the Gutenberg team by, before release. They're kind of, they're a bunch of JavaScript developers. They're focused on the front end and kind of the core user experience. And it's maybe like a later, they're thinking about it a little bit, but it's the work about how the how are plugins gonna integrate with this kind of happens, gonna happen later. So I'm trying to be involved in that discussion so that I can say, hey, my plugin needs these hooks, these filters, these tools. Um, so kind of make sure they get there. But in reality, so some of that, like they might give in and give me some PHP tools to get things done, but in reality, what I'm learning is like, we need to re-change how we think about things and be like, oh, like, we need to be on the JavaScript side. So for different reasons, you want to like prevent members only content from like ever touching the browser at all. Like that's important for security reasons. But if stuff's happening in the JavaScript world, like we have to be there too, to maintain, you know, like manage what's, what's done. So in reality, it's like adding, a whole lot of work for us. Like it's like, oh, we have to build like a front end facing component of the logic of our plugin that decides what's, um, you know, uh, members only or not. Um, and then I think more like the kinds of um, what Tracy was talking about. Though, there's other pieces where you're doing, but um, in the editor space, like people are going to want to edit our checkout page, like they edit any other page. So it's like people are going to get used to using Gutenberg. Uh, the, the new editor, and they're going to expect all the plugins to, to work that way, and they'll be confused when it doesn't. And that, that's like a, it's a good thing, and it's also an opportunity. It's a good thing, like, people use WordPress for their membership site or for an application or something more complicated, because they're like, we're already using WordPress, and I'm very familiar with it. So they're going to feel the same way um, if your plugin supports Gutenberg, like, I'm familiar with it. And use it. So, yeah, we're working with Gutenberg. Thank you. And then Brad. Yeah. Um, I feel like we're maybe not doing enough with it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're doing a lot of the internal training. So we have a, a pretty decent 
size development team. There's about 20 developers on our time. Uh, so we're doing like Zach Gordon's course. We went through that. Um, Gutenberg's based on React, so uh, West Boss actually has a really good React course. So if you're interested in just kind of the bigger picture of how React works, I would check out the, the course from West Boss. It's all online. Uh, so those two together have been really nice for our team because, uh, like Joe said, Long like mentions, you know, learning JavaScript deeply. So this is kind of the future of the development of at least the WordPress platform. So it's important that we kind of understand it outside of just Gutenberg um, in the bigger picture there. But uh, we put together kind of a roadmap as well. We use uh, generally like advanced stuff and field for CMV2 for our metadata um, plugins, you know, to give the visual piece to working with metadata on your content. Uh, we built kind of a you know, quote unquote kind of module builder as we call it, that kind of sits on top of that and allows our clients to basically do like what Gutenberg's doing, like put blocks together and drag and drop and, you know, two column blocks or, you know, six columns, whatever. Um, so we're kind of putting a plan together, we're going to refactor that or basically build it from scratch to work with Gutenberg, right? So um, kind of get that, because we use it not only for our clients, but we do it on our own site. So we're going to work on that internally. It would be a good, it'd be a good way to learn it, get familiar with how to work with React, but also, something that we're going to use like an internal tool that we'll be using for ourselves and for our clients. Um, we're also playing with the idea of, depending on how well that goes, basically converting our site to work with Gutenberg you know, as quickly as possible. So um, it'd be great to like roll out our, our update to our site, right? You know, 5.0 drops are pretty close to it. Um, it's, that's Gutenberg powered, because then it's a great kind of, hey, we're eating our dog food, like we know what we're doing, we've done it on our site, we'll learn a lot. I'd rather break our site than client sites. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to get ahead of it, but it is tricky because of changing so much and being in, in, in a pre beta. It's like you want to learn as much as possible, but, you know, to Joe's point, it's going to change. It's open source. Next week it'll be different. And you don't want to go too far down one path and then a significant change come uh, because then you're just kind of losing your time at that point. So we're treading cautiously, but it's going to start ramping up really soon. This wasn't an official question, but I want to. I realize some of my questions are somewhat duplicative here in my list here. Uh, I wonder if you can speak to. You talked about the technical work that you put into and where your thought process is. Can you talk to what kind of business planning you have done, and is it been a let's just wait and see uh, when it happens, or have, have you folks started to put together actual strategies of of how you're gonna when you're going to learn everything by and what kind of explanations you're going to share with clients and for those with plug-in dependent businesses are you trying to make any kind of financial projections one way or another about what this is going to mean in terms of uh, sales and revenue and things like that and since i started with jess I'll, I'll jump with tracy now if you could if you could start to that yeah i mean we, we, I mean, we don't have like a mapped out a week by week plan, but you know, this deadline of uh, April is looming off over all of us, right? So, we definitely want to have things at least like our tools and our framework that we use Gutenberg ready by the time that hits. So, when we start, you know, whenever we're de developing a new site and a, a new version of that coming up, we usually are developing on the, the data release of that while it's still in development, not yet live. So because by the time it does go live, it's probably going to be that new version. So just to make sure that everything's working. So to, to be ahead of it in that way. For our folks, now, we're going to put on the cloud together. Because we don't, number one, they're not paying us to make their sites good, all of a sudden working with Gutenberg. And there, for them to have like this sudden huge change in their editing experience would be a shock to them. And there's a lot of them, you know? So we're just gonna stick with Pasta Editor on those folks. Um, but moving forward, yeah, we wanna stay, you know, we, we wanna embrace it and, and uh, you know, uh, work it into our workflow. Um, yeah, so we're, we're definitely thinking about it a lot, obviously. It's, it's had a, a couple specific business impacts. One of our plugins adds fields to our checkout. Um, and I was about to give a contract to someone who had already started building a GUI around our process for adding those fields. Uh, we had talked about it, and then 
I was at work camp the last I saw like people working more closely and I was like, oh, a field is a block and why would we build our own custom building when people are going to use blocks? And so I canceled off that contract and said we're going to build it um, in blocks. <coughs> and start. That's what we're kind of like, we're making decisions now about how we build things based on that. Um, and uh, as, like another general, um, it's going to be hard, but we, in general, not just with Gutenberg, but we, as we thought, it'd be great if we have a release whenever WordPress has a major release or a point release even. And especially if it takes advantage of the stuff. So, so we wanted to do this with the REST API, but we were late and we followed. It would have been nice if like, when all the news and excitement is out around the new WordPress release, we could be like, oh yeah, point does, hey Matt, can you call me out at the State of the Union? And um, point does as like a good you know, uh, person in the community that's doing things well. Here's an example of plugging into Gutenberg. So if we can get ahead and, and have something ready on the day of the release, like, I think that would be good for our business. And if I'm not familiar exactly with what all the other e-commerce or membership plugins are doing, but um, if we are the one that's Gutenberg supported and the others aren't, and we get a pretty good lead, like when people are making that decision, which membership plugin should I use? Like, you know, we move up the list for that number. So that's like a goal that we have in mind. And I don't know how that will impact the bottom line. I see it kind of as a cost to, to feel like we have to do this um, and to maintain the business we have more so than growing. Uh, yeah. um, so if you have clients, or if you do, even if you're just helping out people with websites, I think one thing that I've been doing is at the end of every phone call you have with them, you want them to be aware of something else, something's coming. Just yell, Gutenberg's coming, and then hang up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that way they know when it hits, like, oh yeah, you kept yelling it, that was weird. <laughs> but, I mean, seriously, that's part, of, like, maybe not that drastic, but in the in the conversations we're having with clients, like, we're name dropping Gutenberg, like, on a pretty consistent basis at this point because they probably already heard it most of them have already at least heard it they don't maybe don't know what it is but I want them to know that we're watching it you know we're keeping tabs on it and when the time's appropriate we'll have a deeper conversation when it gets more stable probably around beta uh, it's kind of you know like to Tracy's point about clients and pain for like it's kind of put you know clients and you know us and whoever's worked with the clients or whoever in really interesting positions because now we're kind of going back and saying, hey, there's this whole refactor that we might have to do on something maybe we just built like less than a year ago. And if you don't do this, you basically WordPress is going to leave you and you're going to be stuck behind. And the longer you wait to do it, probably the harder and more costly it's going to get, right? So it's really, it, it's, a, it's a very tricky conversation that you need to sit down and think about to have with people that are paying you to help with their sites, uh, or maybe this is just a conversation you have to have with yourself if you're just you know, building your sites on your own for you. Um, but it's something that we're definitely aware of. We want our clients to know we're looking at it. We're keeping tabs on it. We're keeping them as part of the conversation. If they're interested, we'll send them some resources, some videos they can check out to see what's coming. Um, but it's going to have a big impact, especially on, honestly, on our side, like the more enterprise level sites. But it's going to be, I think it's going to be difficult for a lot of those sites to ever use this feature. Um, because of how specific the workflow is and how specific the content is. I'm not saying they won't ever get there, but I think it's going to be a long road to get them there. Um, and it's kind of yet to be seen, like what that road looks like. So, sometimes. <laughs> so, right, I, I agree with what they're all saying. I think for my clients specifically, because they're smaller and a lot of my clients are cost conscious, well, I like all clients are. Um, a lot of the times that when my clients are doing their own work, it's because they don't necessarily want to send stuff over to me. They don't want to see me to add, con add content. So I think, um, as Trace was saying, it's going to be a big change for them. And for some of them, they're used to using um, maybe something like a visual composer, which is more of a page builder as opposed to um, as what Gutenberg is right now. Like with the block concept is great. They do have columns now. Um, well, it's another form of a page builder, which I mean, you're actually creating a full-on page layout. Gutenberg isn't quite there. I think it's going to be a shift for them and a decision for us, like as partners, do we shift to Gutenberg, the Visual Composer update with Gutenberg, um, the Beaver Builder, this all, I mean, a lot of these are really well-supported plugins. Will they integrate still with, um, with WordPress? And I guess it goes to a larger discussion of what happens to these page builders as Gutenberg expands. And I think a bigger question too for me specifically is in terms of my business, um, I do have clients asking me, well, should I be on Wix? Should I be on Squarespace? Um, and so one of the things that's 
something I work hard to understand is like, what is what do my clients need? Do they need, can WordPress provide for them what they need? And is Bloomberg what I need as a small business provider for these clients? Um, so I, I go back and forth in terms of like how to prepare my clients because I think um, many of my clients are well served by like a small visual builder. They're not graphic designers, they're not, they're not technical people at all. Um, and they do well with something visual. And at this point, is Gutenberg going to provide to them what they need? And so, um, and the like Brad and were saying, this is this could be a really big cost for many of those clients. Is this, and it's not something they chose at this point. I mean, one keep current, but they didn't really have much to say that Gutenberg was going to be kind of five point one. So, um, yeah, I think I'll probably just start yelling. So, so for clients uh, that I've got that have essentially Beaver River sites uh, built on something or other that Beaver River is living, when they're giving me all their content to folks, they don't want to, can't. Um, the months pass. 5.0 comes out, Gutenberg's integrated. Do I have to tell, uh, I'm not clear on what I have to do to um, serve them well. To, uh, do, do I have to uh, say, look, there's this you know, new component, new integrated uh, uh, co uh, component of it, uh, and your site needs to be rebuilt in a, uh, in a particular way, and it's going to cost you due to the you know, however much, um, <clears throat> and they're going to say, well, can I just keep sending you stuff and you, you post it and change my pictures and write my text and do all that? Is the answer to that dependent on how well Beaver Builder or whatever BC uh, integrates with Beaver, which I assume they're going to do their start they can work really well. I think Beaver Builder in particular has like a blog post about what they're planning and either the new editor will remove them, Beaver Builder or Beaver Builder will remove the new editor. And so their team is on top of it. I don't know about the Beaver Builder, but well, it seems like they're, yeah, they have stretches and sort of thing. But, <coughs> but I mean, in general, if, yeah. if, if I have, if I have a, a brand new site to build, that's one thing. Probably. Yeah, that's easy. But if I've got one that's been worked on for a year, two years, and it's got all this stuff in it, um, is, is, Brad mentioned WordPress is going to leave you you fine if you don't. Are you assume are you saying that assuming that I that I did not use the version of WordPress that, you, that I didn't go to the Gutenberg Yeah, like you would just, Yeah, when I said that I'm not like you would disable Gutenberg and stick with the you know editor that we're used to today. Okay. But if I did not, should be mm -hmm. a problem. Theoretically mm -hmm. at least that's what it is. Is that fair? I, I think if like Beaver Builder has a update your plugins before you update that WordPress five point out. Because if we're on the ball, we'll have our updates in place so that, but otherwise, like, builders are kind of sketchy because if you update them in the wrong, wrong time, like, then, like, the layout of your post goes, but, yeah. um, but hopefully, so, like, yeah, so if, if Beaver Builder's not ready, like, you kind of run the risk of that. I do think that um, the, the classic editor plugin that they'll release will avoid a hard fork of some sort. Um, you'll just install a plugin and it says if you don't have the new editor. And that's going to work for a few months, maybe a year. It reminds me of the REST API. You used to be able to disable the REST API completely. But after a couple of WordPress versions, like core WordPress functionality relies on the API. And so you have to have the API to run WordPress at all almost. Um, and so I think the same thing will happen with uh, the new editor. It's like after a couple versions after it, there's going to be the editor is what controls the customizer and the settings page and something else. And if you turn off the editor, you break the WordPress site. So you, you got like a year maybe to like, um, and this is a bigger update than in some ways than the rest API in terms of the like, So maybe it'll be more than a year, but yeah. But if you don't have a reason to turn off the, in the initial stage of turning off Gutenberg, you shouldn't have an issue. Theoretically. Yeah. I would test it on stage. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, got, I mean, the issue you could run into is blocks that might not be styled, like the text column block, for example, you need some markup. So if you don't have to get that for that, and your client uses it, it will probably look weird. So I think that's the biggest front-end thing from basic WordPress. 
We did a, we wrote a post on our blog about kind of how your existing content is affected by Gutenberg. I think it's an interesting, it's kind of your point, right? Like what happens when I update with all my stuff that exists? Is something going to change, you know, with that? Um, and I couldn't get in the link, you can send it out, but um, basically as it stood when we wrote the post, which was the beginning of January, you know, because they completely different now. I think it's still the same though, but if your existing content is basically stored as a, turned into a single HTML block. Um, and then you have the option to um, generate blocks, I think it's called, which will basically go through your content and try to break it up into logical block space. So like each paragraph would be its own block, short code would be their own block. So it'll basically try to convert your content into proper Gutenberg format. So it doesn't necessarily just go through and start converting all your content. Um, and, you know, Beaver Builder, like in terms of how it stores your the, the data and the content, I'm not entirely sure, but my guess is the same thing would happen, it would be an HTML block, and if you didn't convert it, it would just keep doing what it's doing, you know, so, um, definitely something to test, but I think it's an interesting one, especially have really complex content, you know, turn on Beaver and see what happens. So I've got a, a question relating to, to plugins generally, really around the, the, the .org repository and those of you with plugins have made it pretty clear that the time requirements to take what it was a PHP driven uh, plugin and convert it to be Gutenberg friendly is not insignificant. It's not a little weekend job. What are your expectations for what the WordPress.org repository will become for plugins that don't have a commercial aspect. So somebody has a, a developer has a need, writes a plugin to address that need, pumps it up into the .org repo and we can all benefit from it, but they don't want to put in the X number of hours to make their app plugin whatever task it was fulfilling Gutenberg friendly. Do you folks have any estimation as to what the likely drop off or outcome of that may be, if any? Yeah. I get the sense in general that it takes more work to make a plugin. It used to be like a weekend warrior project. A lot like some of these plugins and now like they have full community. Um, it seems like the, like the JavaScript stuff is a burden and the API stuff is a burden in some sense. And I, I also feel that I'm probably just like an old time developer now, I'm stuck in my ways, and I'm kind of I'm blind to a lot of the ways that like React and JavaScript are making things easier. And like there's gonna be like four line JavaScript plugins that do awesome things. Um, and that's just not on my radar, so like maybe I'm missing that. But it, it yeah, like WordPress in general is bigger, it's doing bigger things. It's like it used to be just blogs and now it's like e-commerce and you know membership in like these giant, you know, multi-million dollar businesses are run on top of WordPress so the plugins are more complicated and um, but they're still kind of like the way the dot org repository works is as if they're all hobby plugins. Like they assume that people are gonna get free support and everything is free and and so it's like, it funnels people, and people have that mindset, so that when you say, hey, we actually charge, if you want to talk to me on the phone, I'm busy, like, they blow up, and they get upset, and they do this. So it's like, the whole, like, ecosystem is set up as if, like, these are all hobby websites, but they're not, so it's weird, and we talk with, every once in a while, like, the, um, the .org um, team, um, every year at, like, the community summits about, and they do some stuff, like, some of the um, plug-in updates, like, they've been working with us to make it, like, hey, like, this is for business, not just, and, um, but I think there definitely be more of that interaction. So, yeah. Our our biggest plugin is custom post type UI, which is on it's active on like half a million sites. Um, now the good thing is like since you know our name's on it, we want to make sure it works and we want to keep it updated. We'll make sure it works with Gutenberg. Uh, but if you if you and imagine if that plugin broke, right? Like it's a plugin to register custom post types. So if that plugin breaks, half a million sites with custom post types would unregistered themselves, custom taxonomy to unregistered themselves, so the site would probably not function like it's supposed to. Now imagine if it was just someone doing that for fun, and, and there's plenty of those plugins that we rely on that people are doing in their free time, and there's zero financial anything attached to it. Um, and imagine they don't have the time to learn React or figure out Gutenberg and 
and don't actually test because the window is too short, maybe they're in school, they don't have time, whatever, things change. Um, so I think it's a real concern because there's, you know, even in the top 50 plugins, I'm sure a number of those are built by a single person with no revenue streams to fund those plugins. Uh, a lot of them are, and there's, you know, people make money off them. Like we have a premium side to ours that helps offset some of the costs, but um, it's something I think we just need to be aware of. My guess is .org will have some kind of way to flag what you know, plugins that have been improved working with Gooseberg, so you can be a little bit, kind of how you can flag if they work with your version, but it's a matter of whether people actually tell you it's working or not. So I would just be cautious when Gutenberg comes out with some of these plugins. Yeah, you got to test them, especially if it's like a single developer behind it and it's free. You know, there's no guarantee it's going to work. Yeah, I think so. I think I'm probably the only one that doesn't have a plugin here. Or, um, so as a plugin user, though, and having a lot of WordPresses, and I am a, I'm a solo developer. I feel like there's also this burden. So I use ACF and. What if that just falls apart and I, you know, eight sites are running? That's a lot as a single developer. Um, and so that's just one plugin that has, I use WooCommerce on multiple sites. Um, so I think there's also on the other end, yeah, what is going to be expected of me um, to keep the sites that I maintain and run up and running? Um, and yeah, how do I know what plugins are going to just, like I was saying, I mean, yeah, there are, there are probably people that are out there with this plugin because they need it to, fulfill some need and they may not have the revenue stream and they don't have time to run Gutenberg or doing other things or to understand Gutenberg. So I think for uh, small development firms too, that's something we'll all, that will impact us as well to understand what plugins you know, won't be working for us and, and how does that affect us. We're, we're super lucky to give about nine, I think. Most of them do not do anything with this company at all. So, you know? <laughs> Um, but our biggest one, the MailChimp one, that's absolutely going to be effective. And our, our second one that we have a premium plugin for is a WooCommerce plugin. WooCommerce makes my life miserable on a good day. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, 3, three came out and they, um, they broke the archive template which runs like your store and all of your product pages. And then they're like, uh-oh, we're breaking all these sites and they rolled it down. So three, two, six. So I'm trying to fix it, and then I go to the thing to get the new text. I'm like, wait a minute, this is three, two, six. What's going on here? And they actually rolled it back, and it still hasn't happened yet. Yeah. But I was able to fix it, get off. <coughs> yeah. So it's a success story. But we are reliant on them for our one plugin. Our plugin is just a. It allows you to add custom tabs to products. So we really have. We do nothing when it comes to content at all for that. We just hook into WooCommerce's existing tab making functionality. But what are they going to do with that tab making functionality? That, that's how we're going to be impacted by you know, this other plugin that we make this plugin for. So that's going to be interesting to see how, how, what happens with WooCommerce and Google. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to change the order of questions that I shared with you, and I'm going to ask if you can speak to kind of what are your thoughts on where the driving force behind Gutenberg is coming? What is, why Gutenberg, why now, uh, what is it, who in our community is really driving this forward, and um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> well, because I mean, historically, it's, it's there are the community is wide and diverse, right? And, and as it gets more and more used across the globe, there's there's different businesses, there's different business models, there's different focuses, there's all sorts of different ways that WordPress is getting gets used, and that businesses uh, evolve around it, and just in the earlier days of WordPress, it went from blog software developed into a full content management system. Uh, we saw the development of uh, an entire ecosystem around plugins and how you know businesses evolved around writing that code and serving that code and updating that code and agencies developed around designing and building and then marketing on top of that, all these different sorts of things. And 
what is the, the, the impetus for a Gutenberg? You know, what's, what's the drive? We certainly heard about that there's concerns that as an editor for content for people new to content management system, it's perhaps not as intuitive as maybe something like a Wix or a Squarespace. And so is, 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 is that our understanding that this is the driver for it? And then ultimately then, who is going to benefit from that? Will the plugin maker, the what? I think you just answered the question. <laughs> maybe I did, maybe I did. I, yeah, I mean, I think automatic as like a post, you know, WordPress.com host to make their interface easier for their users is a large drive force. I mean, like automatic in general is a driving force behind a lot of core updates. And I don't know if it seems this one in particular. I read your question and I was going through the GitHub repo and I was like, let me learn more about these people who are committing a lot. A lot of them work at automatic. Um, <clears throat> and so I think they're, they're kind of the impetus and I think there's a lot of pushback from maybe like agencies and flight developers and stuff, but I think we're all going to benefit at some point. I mean, I think obviously if you like your customers that invested last year on a website and now they have to like they're the losers. Um, like your customers a year from now when you start a new website for them are, are going to be winners, I think, as we do get things like uh, human made in the UK. So I don't know if they're top of who made it. Co. UK maybe or something. Um, uh, they had a cool demo, they, they did a post on Gutenberg, and they had a really cool demo where like one of their page layouts is all blocked up, and it's like, this is the lead, and you type the lead for your story, and like, this is the main masthead image, like it's all labeled, and it goes exactly where it should go, and so I think in the past that might have been like an HTML template that people had to make sure that they fit it in the right way, or maybe you're using like a custom field solution, so they just type some body content and then they have to find the field that's the mass head. And right, or you know, you fill out, a, it's easy to yeah. use, you fill it all out, but then you have to hit save and cross your fingers that it looks yeah. the way you want to look. Or, or maybe you're using a builder, but, um, and the builders I think have some tools to lock them down sometimes, but it's like a builder and then they're like, oh, I, I think five columns will look good, and they change it, and you're like, oh, it's ugly, you messed it up. <laughs> um, so it seems like, a lot of that's in mind so that if you as an agency build a new website for someone and you're like, this is your recipe page, and like you lay it all out the way you want it, and when you add a new recipe, you fill in the blocks, and like that's it. Um, like that'll be easy to set up for someone, and that'll be a good experience, like for the handoff and stuff. And same, same way thing in a, the plugin space. Um, people see the way our page, we have to generate pages to support our plugin, and they're like, oh, I wish that like the, you know, the account section was above the, you know, link set, the invoice section, and they're like, so here's some code to do it, and then they have to do custom code to do that. So if we split it up in the two blocks, like so now it's like, oh, I just drive one block above the other. And so they're kind of expecting to interact. I think at all levels in WordPress, like they want to be able to like click and drag things. And it's good that, that that kind of stuff can be enabled for users. Yeah, I agree. Square <laughs> space, Wix, and Medium yeah. are the drivers. I think for me, like one of the things, I agree, I think in the long run it's going to be good for WordPress. It's one thing that stands out for me though is it feels like WordPress is, is playing catch up. And even just a few years ago, WordPress was the leader. Like everybody was trying to catch WordPress. And then at some point, things started passing WordPress. I don't know exactly when that happened. And I don't think I saw it happening either. And now it's like, now we're being reactive to all the other things that are out there. And it started happening a little bit if anyone remembers post formats. That one was one that always stuck with me because it was so good. The way they implemented it was weird. And it was almost an exact copy of Tumblr, and that was the big competitor four or five years ago with WordPress, and now Wix and Squarespace and Medium. Uh, and almost no one uses Yeah, to the point where they're even talking about removing it. So, you know, I, I hope that this is a stepping stone. Like, I, I, can, I can picture the grand scheme here. I think this is definitely like a stepping stone. I just hope it's the right one to kind of get us back out in front, where everyone else was looking at WordPress like, we need to be doing what they're doing, because that's crazy, you know. Um, we'll see. I mean, I, I, I think we'll get there. It's just, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I, I feel like this is going to be a little changeful this next year. But I am excited by my clients being able to, you know, if they have a staff page instead of, you know, filling out the email and bio and, you know, they're, they're seeing it as it's going to be. They drop the photo in. They see how the text will look, you know. So they can edit their content so it looks nice. Where now they, they put their content in and sometimes it doesn't look so great and they haven't really paid attention to 
make it look nice, you know, but now they'll be able to do like see how it's going to look before they can publish so I'm excited about that. And if they start coming with their own hacks, they're like, why didn't you put the bio in the title space? You're gonna think it looks fake. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. I think we I mean I think we all want like WordPress to succeed and be better than and be this this leader and it feels like at some point we did fall behind so that it's not easy um, for our clients to add in that they're doing some hacks, they're trying to do things, and I think if we can, we can set it up in this way that allows them to easily create this really beautiful content, make these beautiful websites, they don't have to use Wix, they don't have to use Medium. I mean, they, those are pretty websites, and they're working because they make their content look really good, and, and clearly, I hand off content, I mean, I look, three months later, I look at a website, I'm like, oh my god, what, what did this person do? And so I think it's probably the experience we've all had, we hand it off to our clients, and then, yeah, we go back and like, this, this isn't anything I put together. I don't want to put this on the portfolio page even. So, um, so I think that's, like, that would be, like, the most incredible thing here is that we move forward and, and, and are creating these great sites, because WordPress is in 20% of the book right now, so. Wait, you have to call like the business editor. Yeah, it's <laughs> awful, you know, to actually make anything that looks good. Mm -hmm. For somebody that knows zero, it's just not CSS. So, thank you for saying All right, I'm going to do one question that was emailed to me from our group, and then I will turn it over to the, to the, to the group here, and we can ask questions of the panel. Um, and I think Joe's already talked to some of this, and some of what you said, but maybe we could just get a direct answer on it. And the question was, at what point during 2018 will it be better to delay building new WordPress sites and just wait to build them in Gutenberg from the ground up rather than having to convert? Should I read the question again? <laughs> I'd love to know that answer. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if there is going to be like a specific point in time, right? It's it's probably like, again, having it as a conversation, it's like you're talking to someone, but say, well, this is coming and we could delay, but at the end of the day, do you want to like not start on a new project because of it, you know? But I think if you're upfront about it, and say this is coming, but we can turn it off, or we can build against this when it's in a rough beta state, but just though it might be a little bumpy and cost a little bit more and maybe take a little bit longer, you know, I think it's just an open conversation you have to have. It's fine. You like the customizer. It's like, you know, we have plugins that we sell that relies on the customizer and they change it all the time. You know, every release, something breaks, it, it you know, and we have to do it in a new way. So I, I just think you have to, I, I don't, delaying is not a good idea, but everybody has their own, you know, uh, production schedules and your team may be small and you may be one person and not have the time. So I just, you know, whatever timeline you can do. It's yeah, still like we're in this like weird in between phase where some uncertainty. We're not really sure where things are going. And yeah, I'm I'm putting out projects now for March and April, and it's hard to know that what I might be putting together might be offended a bit by this release. Yeah. But then imagine if you delay, it right. doesn't come out until like October. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I can't I can't like hold. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think most people involved are making a, a strong effort to make things backwards compatible, both work on the plugin side, like people build their cloud visual composer and MS, and then also the core team to make it. And they will give you like a year, at least, I think, of like being able to run a WordPress site with the you know, people turned off. And so, yeah, I would probably wait for the official release, maybe when it's like a, a release candidate. Um, although, that's confusing too, because at some point it's gonna, uh, they're gonna take the code out of like, the feature plugin and move it to like the core nightly build. So, I probably like running, I, I bet at some point you could run the Gutenberg plugin, for, like it, it, it won't crash as often as it does, and it won't kind of like love your content as often as it does now. I think it's better and better. Uh, like at some point it'd be pretty stable, like you could like run Gutenberg on a live site. Um, not yet, maybe, maybe in like a couple months, but then they're gonna start moving that code into core. And it probably won't change substantially then, but then you won't really be able to easily run the most updated version. So. And, and then yeah. you have like a weird switch off then when you like uninstall the plugin and upgrade the WordPress 5.0. Yeah, it's weird. So probably I would just wait until it. You just fuck yourself out of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of okay. I think, yeah, wait for it. We had a REST API plugin that um, 
that, that allows you to, it has, it's like a nice little GUI for your endpoints to turn things off, rename them and stuff. And before it was in core, you know, worked a certain way. And then when it was in core, now our plugin is, we had to change the way our plugin was coded to work with it in core. So that, that's a thing too, switching from feature plugin to core. So if you put like a really kick ass like block template on the plugin, and that transition from plugin to core, your template might be. <laughs> Do you see um, um, a world where <coughs> the classic uh, plugin, the classic template plugin, would sunset? Let's say it would only be hypothetically, it would only work for 5.0, and then maybe 5.1, it wouldn't be available. In other words, would it automatically force people to be using the input in the future case? People may be using it. That, that in between time will only last for the final period. Did you see that as a possibility? I think it's like that. Yeah. yeah, I think like the, the classic editor plugin that turns off the new editor. Yes. I think they do plan to like not, or they'll keep it out there, but they'll like, it'll be unofficially supported, like not supported after a year or two. Um, and just generally like the new editor, like could just be your whole post is one block with the tiny MC editor in it. So like, if you have a pretty straightforward WordPress site, that should be an issue. But if you have a more complicated layout, Using page builders, is that your things like that? that might be. Is that your I think they've even said. Say I think even Matt had an answer like that at the state of the word. That he said something mm -hmm. like, "We'll have that plugin for a year, and then." Yeah, I, either him or what someone on the Google team had said something like that. Because I think someone pressed him on it. You want to be able to use it forever and the product. I don't know. Quote me on that. I'll try to find that exact. I'll try to find. Actually, after this tonight, I'll try to find some more, any more official position to say that, but I, I remember hearing that, that that's kind of what. Technology yeah. is progressing, and I, my, our clients who, you know, we do a lot of work for, they don't keep a site for more than three or four years if we're building a new one, anyway. So just time marches on, and you know, old sites get retired, and new sites get built, so I think we'll all just, you know, yeah, okay. I think kind of naturally, like some new plugin will come out that needs Gutenberg or some feature. Kind of like the next step, I don't think it would be too early, but probably like a year from now, the new editor, like JavaScript, will start being used for like settings pages and, and customizers. So, like, when they change your layout or your menus or something, like, I, I, these are kind of ideas that people have, but a, a year or two from now, like, you know, I mean, there's going to be something in WordPress using, like, the new editor technology that your clients might want, and then you're like, oh, we have to, like, turn off that plugin, and, you know, so that you can get the new Twitter plugin or whatever. Something like that. Yeah. I was wondering if you guys have any uh, insight on uh, how Gutenberg affects performance on websites. The reason I ask is because there's, at least in, in my world of SEO, like there, there's this continual push to make sites faster and faster, right? Um, I mean, even Google has an update coming out in July. Where if your mobile site's slow, you know, you know drop <coughs> as opposed to sites that are faster. And so, when I'm hearing about you know the shift from PHP to JavaScript, right? I'm wondering if there's if that's a better performance for a website, or if Gutenberg brings better speed uh, for websites. I wonder if you guys could share any insights on that. If you know. Yeah. Kind of question. I know. Yeah. I never benchmarked it or looked into it. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure. My instincts tell me that it, it shouldn't matter too much. I mean, okay. a little bit. Um, like in terms of like uh, the new editor trying to figure out blocks and generate them. Like it should be relatively as fast as like, it does other things. Okay. Um, but yeah, like the move to JavaScript is kind of is big, and in general, if done well, speeds up websites quite a bit because you you load like the bare bones and you pull in content kind of asynchronously through JavaScript. So if you do it in the right way, um, the page will load like really fast. Like uh, there's a oh someone uh, has a plugin that uh, uses React for the list tables in the in the dashboard. I forget the name of that. Um, but it's on it's on GitHub now. But you basically like it uses the React JavaScript technology to draw like the user search, the post search, and the, and the admin, and it's like light like, speed, like it's super fast. It's, it doesn't have to reload the whole page. It just like queries the data and updates the table. And so 
stuff like that, and the admin will feel the admin will feel a lot faster. And and I actually, think that's, that's a big pain that's, point. That's that's where most of the speed is going to be felt. Okay. I'm interested in uh, what your estimates would be for the overhead in testing and maintenance uh, of the moving of active code from the server to client space. It, you know, that's got to have a hit. The overhead of the testing and, test and, and, and yeah. I mean, in terms of like, like the overhead of like the company to spend time. Yeah, I know it's how much more expensive it's going to be for you to make that website. I mean, I think once you get it, once you, it's a familiar tool, um, I, w I wouldn't expect it to be too much overhead. It's just the ramping up and the learning process of understanding React, understanding JavaScript better, understanding Gutenberg, that's definitely going to be a very um, big cost for a lot of people. Um, I mean, for everyone, even even just if you're you know doing it on your own, because there's going to be a time commitment that you're not going to get paid. It's, it's hard to find clients that pay you to learn stuff. <laughs> it's, it's impossible. And, and, you know, even when we were starting out, like, we had agreements with clients like, oh, we've never done this before. We'll do it for a cheaper rate. Just know it might take a little bit longer. And those were great, great, you know, engagements. Kind of a win-win, right? Um, but those are those are hard to find sometimes. So um, a lot of that cost is just got to be time where it's not the wolf. You have to eat it. You have to know that I, if I don't know this, the other people are out there learning this exact same thing. And my clients will find them. My new, you know, the new people come in the world find people proficient in Gutenberg. So, um, yeah, I mean, we'll be tracking the internal costs. It, it'll be a decent amount. For sure. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of upfront costs for uh, revising all of our tools that we use right now to work with Gutenberg. But once that's done and it's all up and running and good, it, it's not going to be like this ongoing extra time needed to make every website better. I was gonna add a couple points kind of mind related to that is um, sometimes it's hard with like the JavaScript PHP that like you don't know where the code is, so you have to like search both kinds of code bases and that's confusing. Um, so that'll happen more. But then also the JavaScript documentation of WordPress core is generally not as good as the PHP, but they're actively trying to fix that. Like if you look um, like at the tracker for core WP besides like all the Gutenberg stuff, there's like an effort like update the JavaScript doc block comments and stuff, and there's, you know, like, a thousand JavaScript files, and people are taking them one at a time to improve the documentation, so that should help people like me who are, like, JavaScript-first developers and PHP-first developers, so, like, to be able to interact with JavaScript. And I believe what Trish was saying, this is part of doing business, this is, like, we're in a technology field, like, it's gonna, it's going to change, and if we want to be, if we all want our clients to have the best websites, we want to, like, Keep doing business. I don't want to. I don't want to stop what I'm doing. I like what I'm doing, and I think that's that's it. That's part of doing business. We're gonna have to invest this time to be better developers, to and to serve our clients better. Like that's what our like, we're helping our clients grow their businesses. So this is at the core. Like this is what we should be doing is to get better and to you know, serve us all too. They're not gonna have to wait for first space. That's what we want to keep building. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it is a larger, probably a larger condensed cost, but it's a great point. Like, technology is always evolving. So imagine, like, what, five, six years ago when responsive was like yeah. it was, and I was yeah. like, well, what's that? I need to learn that. And now, of course, everybody knows what that is. And so whether you code it or use a theme that is responsive, you know it needs to be there, right? Yeah. The mobile, you know, fast pages, like, you need to understand that. You need to look into things like AMP and understand, is that something I should be offering to my clients or I should have on my website? What is AMP? You know, so we're always... Doing it is usually more spread out in, in, in probably smaller chunks where this is more of a condensed up front like learn if you're not already familiar with React and especially Google. So like to back on the JavaScript discussion, you have the emergence of CMS as like a keystone JS or posture with you know, basic node. Is Gutenberg an attempt to move toward that or is it, is it something different altogether? Yeah, okay, um, I, I don't know if they'll move to Node particularly as like a backend, but I think there is, I think the, probably the long-term vision, if you talk to Matt, I'll talk about, is that like WordPress API becomes like a small API driven PHP app and all the kind of, um, you know, actual parts of WordPress will move to JavaScript. And it, 
it's going to be a slow transition compared to like the, the new CMSs that start out that way. But like the the PHP, I, see, I say that, but also like uh, the reality of WordPress is like holds that down. This is getting kind of into the weeds of the coding. Um, but like the customizer worked that way, where a lot of the code was in JavaScript, and PHP developers were like, when I'm in the back end, I need to interact with the customizer before like the page even loads, and so they add these like wrappers in PHP to the JavaScript, and so then you can interact with the JavaScript in PHP. So that stuff kind of like there's like a force like doing that, and kind of when I talked to the Gutenberg developers, I was kind of like talking like, like you need to some of your JavaScript functions need to be like you know I need to interact with them in the PHP. And so you're kind of like pulling the PHP back, or the JavaScript back in the PHP. But I think the bigger vision is like the PHP should just get this data from the database, massage the data, and like JavaScript should do the forward. That's kind of the modern like app development process like for everything now. So yeah, it's moving towards that. And it'll be like a slow process of like stuff that's in PHP moving to JavaScript. But I do feel like there's a force that's like holding it back. Uh, Well, we're coming up on an hour, and if uh, anybody else's back is like mine, I think uh, I'm breaking at an hour. Certainly, our panelists have been sitting there without any back and forth for <laughs> almost an hour. Or so, um, at this point, we'll we'll just formally wrap up the panel. But we have we can stay into the room until uh, by nine o'clock. We have to be out, so we've got a better part of half an hour to keep chatting and asking questions informally. So hopefully, you'll join me in thanking our panelists for the. For the